This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Life is different than, well, you know, I guess just, you know, if you think about Christians in the culture today have a lot of labels that, you know, for whatever, inflict, self-inflicted, imposed, you know, there's a number of things that you kind of have to detangle. Yeah. And being able well, to, look at yeah. when somebody, yeah, I agree with you entirely, like bigot. Mm-hmm. Like transphobic, mm-hmm. like homophobic, like Islamophobic. Yeah. Now these are all nasty names that are no, there's no substance to them at all mm-hmm. because a phobia is a fear. And in none of those cases are the vast majority of Christians who are called those names fearful of those things, mm-hmm. except for maybe Islamophobic, but for a different reason. Mm-hmm. You know, Islam is the most dangerous religion in the world. And not just dangerous to us, dangerous to people all over the world. And mm. I mean, this is no duh. This is this is daily news type thing, okay? And that fear or apprehension is un, is justified. It's understandable. Mm. Two thousand nine hundred seventy-seven people lost their lives as a result of Islamic terrorism mm. here on American soil. That was twenty-one years ago. We just had the the memorial, so to speak, of it recently. Mm. But the the po- broader point I'm making is uh, that that's just rank name-calling, mm. okay? So one of the tactics, and I call this tactic um, sticks and stones. Now, I don't know if your folks ever ta- told you this. When I was a kid, my mom would say, sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. So mm. people call you names and you just ignore it, you know, rise above it kind of thing. Mm. But now it's a standard tactic for critical issues in culture just to call names and dismiss people like that. Mm -hmm. So when somebody calls you a name, always ask for clarification. Mm. You're intolerant. What do you mean you're intolerant? What do you mean? What do you mean I'm intolerant? So you're asking for a definition. So Mm -hmm. that's another what do you mean by that question, right? Yeah. I really trade on that question a lot in Mm -hmm. its different forms. What do you mean I'm intolerant? Well, you think you're right. Do you think, Josh, that when I give an opinion, do you think I think I'm right? <laughs> yeah, of course I think I'm right, all right? <laughs> yeah. Everybody who has an opinion about something thinks they're right about it, right? Yeah. So that means in this conversation that I'm having, whatever the issue happens to be, whether it's abortion or sexual issues or Jesus or whatever, mm-hmm. of course I think I'm right, but mm-hmm. I'm not the only one in the conversation who thinks I'm right. Mm-hmm. So does the other person think they're right too, but I'm the only one being called a name. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So then I'm going to ask another question. Well, I do think I'm right. I could be mistaken about it. I'm willing to talk about it. But let me ask you: Do you think you're right? Mm-hmm. Now, what are they going to say? They can't say can't no. Say I no. think my views are wrong. Yeah. Oh, but the, my follow-up question is: Why is it when you think you're right, when I think I'm right, I'm intolerant? Mm. But when you think you're right, you're just right. What am I missing here? Mm. Of course, I'm not missing anything. This is just name calling, and so that l- that's also in the book. That little exchange, it's it's meant to help the other person see that this is not helpful. Mm-hmm. You know, if I said, "Well, maybe I'm intolerant, but you're you're ugly," <laughs> no, which and your mom dresses you, I wouldn't say <laughs> that kind of thing because it would be impolite yeah. and it's irrelevant. Yeah, can ugly people be right sometimes? Mm-hmm. Don't we hope so? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, so uh, it's irrelevant. I want them to try to get back on, t- tr- on track, get away from the name calling, mm. which we were supposed to get rid of like in third grade, and get back to the discussion about the issue mm-hmm. to try to figure out who, what's the correct way to approach the issue mm. as individuals or as a culture. Yeah. You know, and, but all of this name calling is is meant to distract, and this is what you're referring to. So there's a little tactic. Mm-hmm. It's basically the first Columbo question: when somebody calls you a name, ask for a definition. Mm-hmm. Get clear on this. And a lot of times they're not going to be able to define it. You're a homophobe. What's a homophobe? Well, somebody's afraid of homosexuals. Well, I'm not afraid of them. Um, what, do you, what are you getting at with this? Or they might say, well, you think homosexuality is bad. Yeah. Do you think that's the wrong view for me to hold? Yes. Well, are you a Christian phobe? Mm. Or a heterophobe? I mean, how does it help that, okay, so I'm a homophobe. What if I just, and I did this on a TV show once. What if I just accept, accept it? I just say, okay, you're right, I'm a homophobe. Or whatever they call me. Mm. 
Why don't, okay, I, I'm the bad guy. Okay, no. Can we talk about the issue? Mm -hmm. Now, we all agree that I'm bad, but now we're just talking about my character. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the ideas anymore. Yeah. It's a, it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. So can we get back to the topic? Yeah. Anyway. what? So a lot of these issues revolve around like almost chance encounter type interactions and disagreements, right? Um, and being equipped to just talk to anyone about these issues. What does it look like though, if you have a disagreement with someone maybe who's in your life for a long time? Yeah. Like how does asking questions help? Whereas once you've gotten to a point where I've asked this level, I mean, I've kind of left the, the shallow end of the pool. We've gotten to the deep end, we've come back, but it's like, this is someone who I'm going to continue to be in my life. Sure, yeah. Well, you're right. A lot of these conversations are with family members. Mm -hmm. especially on these more heated cultural topics mm -hmm. uh, because you have almost everybody in their family, at least an extended family, has somebody who's, who's gay or lesbian mm -hmm. or calls themselves transsexual, somebody going through gender confusion of some sort, whether mm -hmm. it's real or contrived, and a lot of it's contrived. In other words, a fad is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. This is absolutely obvious to even Bill Maher, for goodness sake, and he's been doing screeds about this. And uh, the um, as even as a liberal, he understands this lot of nonsense going on. But the conversations are going to be cl with closer family members mm -hmm. or fa friends, co-workers, okay, mm -hmm. that you have longer term relationship. All the more important that we're careful mm -hmm. about how we engage. All the more important that we are gracious because we do not want to sever the rela damage the relationship if at all possible. Now I understand, and you already know this, Josh, and so do a lot of our viewers here, that the way the culture works now, if you don't agree with their extreme views, what I would consider extreme, um, then they will sever the relationship with you mm. and blame you for it, mm. you know? Mm. So uh, sometimes you can't control that. And this tempts a lot of believers to compromise the truth mm. so that they can save their friendships, mm. okay? And um, I think we ought to try to save the friendships and the relationship and the family. But there is a line that we have to draw. Mm -hmm. Some hills are not worth dying on, but there are hills that are. And most of these discussions are the culture's way of, of enforcing a foreign worldview on Christians. And not the way others say, you're forcing your views on me, because we're not forcing anything. We're just telling you what we think is right, and what we think is right applies to them, and mm -hmm. that really bugs them. Mm -hmm. The culture isn't just saying, here's our view that applies to you. The culture is saying, here is our view, and you have to act like you believe it. Mm -hmm. With the words that you use, and the way you comport yourself, and all that, and if you don't act like, we're gonna punish you and we're gonna sever the relationship, we're gonna lose your job. People are losing their jobs for pronouns now, mm. okay? Um, and this is where Christians just have to decide what side they're gonna stand on. Mm. Uh, I have more to say about those relationships, but I, I just wanna make an observation about loyalty first. In Mark 15, Jesus is on trial with Pilate before the mob, and Pilate's trying to get Jesus off. Mm. Um, because he knows Jesus is not guilty of anything worthy of death. And so he's bargaining with the crowd, trying to mollify them. Mm -hmm. And he realizes he can set somebody free. He's got Barabbas, he's got Jesus. Who do you want? They said, give us Barabbas. Then he, he said, well, what do we do with Jesus? Crucify him. Verse 15 of Mark 15. So it's Mark 15, 15, easy to remember. Mm. Here's what it says. Wishing to please the crowd wishing to please the crowd. Pilate released Barabbas and had Jesus scourged and crucified. Mm. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who identify as Christians who want to please the crowd. Mm -hmm. And they, they side with Pilate instead of with Christ. They'd rather have their friends be happy with them than Jesus be happy with them. And I don't ever want to be in Pilate's sandals, so to speak. Mm. I want to side with the Savior even if it costs me. Mm. So the MO here is that we want to try to protect these relationships as much as possible and still hold to our convictions without folding. Mm -hmm. We don't have to get in fights with people. A harsh word stirs up anger. 
A gentle answer turns away wrath. That's Proverbs. Mm. So that's the way we want to comport ourselves. But we want to be shrewd also. Gentle but shrewd, Jesus said. So this is why we use questions as much as we can to navigate in conversations. Mm. And if push comes to shove, and it often does, and the demand is made that we affirm a foreign worldview, a worldview that is hostile to God and the way he made the world, and it's on an issue that matters. And personally, I think pronouns matter. Then we can't give in. Mm. Now, what what pronouns? They're little bitty things. What, what if they're such little things? Then why has so much ink been spilt and careers destroyed because of those little bitty things? Because this is the skirmish line in a battle of worldviews. Mm. You must act like my worldview, secular worldview, mm. is true. You can believe anything you want. You just can't say it. Mm. You've got to act like we're right and you're wrong. If you're not, we're going to punish you. Well, this mm. is no different than what Christians have gotten for for, for ages and yeah. ages and ages. Do you think there's any merit to an argument that some people feel like Christians have acted that way in the past, where like Christians have been like, this is my worldview, and you have to act like it's true? I guess specifically in American culture? Well, um, I think that's true in some measure. Mm -hmm. um, so this raises the question, how much of, of uh, let's just say, Christian morality is probably the issue, ought to be features of public morality, mm, that's policy a, issues? a long question. Pardon me? That's a big question. It is a big question, and the, the sensibilities about that have changed over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the cultural norms, too. When I was a kid, you couldn't get anything done on Sunday. Mm. And the reason is the stores weren't open. Yeah. Why? It was Sunday. You don't work on Sunday. Oh, maybe a grocery store, but most, most places just closed down. Mm -hmm. And so there was a cultural acknowledgement that Sundays were special, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so the, the, it's like the Gentile version of keeping the Sabbath holy type thing. Even if people weren't Christian, this was just the cultural momentum. Now that's changed quite a bit, and I get mm -hmm. that. The question now becomes um, which of which details of Christian conviction are are important for the public good. Mm. Okay, you read the Constitution, which who does that anymore? Uh, the Declaration, who does that? I had to memorize the the the, the, the first part of the Declaration and the preamble of the Constitution, we the people of the United States, uh. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I can't remember it all now, but it was <laughs> to secure domestic tranquility and provide for the common welfare. Mm. Okay, so that's why the Constitution was developed, to protect people and build a good community. Okay, mm -hmm. so then what are the kinds of things that we think morally um, are, are for domestic tranquility or for the common good? And that, well, the Bible says thou shalt not murder. That's Ten Commandments. That's Mosaic Law. Yeah, but it's not good, regardless of whether it's in the law or not, we're not mm -hmm. under the law, it's still not good to murder, mm -hmm. okay? So we're going to insist on something like that. Now the question becomes, is abortion an example of murder? Mm. Okay, well, that's that's largely a a not a biblical question, although there's a biblical answer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that comes from Luke chapter 1. Because here you got John the Baptist filled with the Holy Spirit mm. in his mother's womb mm -hmm. in the second trimester because he's in the presence of Jesus, who is a zygote, mm -hmm. in the first trimester. Mm. Okay, yeah. and uh, in Mary's womb. So there you got, yeah, they're they're themselves. That's Jesus. That's John. Mm. And so I mean, you can make a biblical case, but you don't need the Bible to make the case that un the unborn are in fact not mom inside mom's body, not mom's body, and are different individuals and the kind of individual they are, are human. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you take their lives, you are killing an innocent human being. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no rhetoric in that at all. These are all scientific descriptions, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay, now is it right to do that? for the reasons that people have abortion. So uh, to me, the obvious answer is no. And uh, at least with slavery, they didn't just kill every slave. They just enslaved them, and that was gruesome enough. Mm. With the unborn, we're killing them. Okay, so no one would countenance slavery in America now. and you know We're still suffering under that sin, that national sin. We're mm. still paying the price for it, but abortion. So 
so should we restrict abortion? Yeah. Should we restrict murder? Yes. Well, abortion kills an innocent human being without proper justification. This isn't capital punishment. They haven't committed a crime. This isn't self-defense. That's right where the baby's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. It's not assaulting the woman's body. The mother is building the baby in her own body, for goodness sake. So so th that's an example, and you s heard some quick reasoning that I offered mm -hmm. why uh, a, a place where it is appropriate, I think, to take what some people might call Christian morality and impose it on the culture. Mm -hmm. It's because of the gravity of the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's there are a number of things that are like that. But the issue now is not whether Christians impose their morality on culture. It is whether culture imposes its morality on Christians. You know, same-sex marriage, for example, when SCOTUS, the Supreme Court, uh, passed the, the Obergefell case in 2015, uh, legalizing same-sex marriage, they did not give any same-sex couple any more liberty than they already had. All of the activity of being married, so to speak, they were already doing. Their whole cottage industry supporting same-sex couples walking down the aisle and ple pledging their troth until death do them part and all that other stuff. Mm. It gave them public approval. It, it was the state saying that there is no difference between a same-sex couple and a heterosexual couple. And so as a state, we are going to treat them the same. Mm. Now, there's a big difference between those two because men and women are different, and they function differently in society. They build families where same-sex couples don't do that characteristically. So they're totally different category, mm. okay? But notice what happened, though. This wasn't religious people trying to force their view on others. If that were the case, there wouldn't be people have have domestic unions before that. You can't live together if you're not married, or there were no laws saying that. Mm. Yeah. No, it was the other side forcing their view on everyone. We all have to acknowledge that this is a real marriage, which means one's sex slash gender, and now you have to make that distinction sometimes, it, uh, doesn't make any difference to what marriage actually is. That was a statement of the people now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the other side forcing their view on us. So what's going on now is not religious people forcing their views illicitly. Mm. It's the other way around. Mm. And the minor exception would be, uh, I should say minor, like the, maybe the one exception would be abortion, but that's not a religious view. Mm -hmm. I, I never argue religiously, biblically, mm. regarding abortion in the public square. There's no need to do that. I haven't done it for years and years and years. I've only just begun doing it in churches. Mm. Because there's so many Christians that think abortion is fine. Hmm. Uh, anyway, so yeah, what do you think if if as we see this cultural shift of um, who's influencing who or who's you know imposing right? How how do believers respond to that? How do you respond to um, even like specific things that we're like, oh, we know biblically, scientifically that this is what's right, but this. The inertia is going the other way. Okay, so I'm going to give you two examples, one biblical and one historical, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, when Daniel was told, you cannot pray, mm -hmm. when Daniel was told, you cannot pray, which was his habit to mm -hmm. pray three times a day, he went to his home, opened his windows, and prayed at the top of his voice. That's what got him in the lion's den, mm -hmm. okay? What he did is he said, no, I refuse to to not do what I'm. it's appropriate for me to do mm. before God. Okay, so there's one example. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, th there are going to be nuances regarding different issues in their culture. People are going to have to make a decision, but... Mm. But there were lots of people during COVID who, lots of churches. John MacArthur's church, famously, because in California, he got a lot of heat from the governor. But his wasn't mm. the only church that, uh, you know, uh, that, that didn't close. A lot of churches didn't close. Mm. Okay. They just kept going. Um, 
Jack Hibbs over at uh, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. He had he had he had six thousand people in his church, and in, within a year a year later, he had fifteen thousand because mm. all the other churches were closing foolishly, I think, and so they came to Jack's place. Mm. So they just said no. This was a parallel to to uh, Daniel, mm. and. Um, in, in, in their case, Jack Hibbs did write a letter to the governor and said, I'm sorry, we respect you and everything, but this, this is, you've gone too far. Mm. This is beyond your purview. You can't tell us not to meet, mm. okay? And in, then our governor said, well, you can, at one point, okay, you can meet, you could meet, but you can't sing. You think about this. This mm. is Gavin Newsom. He was our governor. He is our governor. You can meet, but you can't sing, mm. please. You can pray, but not out loud. Mm. Don't move your. I mean, where are they going to draw the line? Mm. You can't kiss your wife on the lips. You can kiss her on the. Who, please. Mm -hmm. But what's happening is people are just kind of, as I heard, just going along and accepting all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a biblical example. In 1933, in Germany, uh, the Third Reich passed a, a, a law that had in it what's called the Aryan paragraph. And the Aryan paragraph said that no Jew can uh, can have any position. Maybe it was thirty five, but it was right during that time. Have any position of leadership in the government anywhere? Okay, so the Jews were kicked out of the leadership of the government, and it was just one way of just dis, uh, distancing them from everything cultural, mm. impoverishing them so they can move them on, mm. ship them east, which is what they did um, eventually. Um, but this meant that in the churches, any Jew that was in a position of leadership in a church, like a Jew who had believed in Jesus, mm. in the Lutheran churches there, for example, um, they couldn't have positions of leadership in the church, like elder or mm. deacon or anything like that. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, after you know, writing letters and pleading and cajoling, etc., just said, no, we're not going to do this. You have no right, government, mm -hmm. to tell the church of Jesus Christ what it looks like on the inside. Only Jesus can do that. Mm. We say no. Okay. Now, of course, it costs Christians to say no to the government that's encroaching inappropriately on religious freedom mm. and, uh, and, and requiring other people to do something similar. Christians have to start saying no. And to use a, a line from Solzhen, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, which I don't want to embarrass you, but I'm just kind of curious. Do you know who this man is? I don't. See, this, I have almost never talked to anybody younger than 50 who knows who he is. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a Christian, Soviet dissident, Nobel laureate, who spent 10 years in the Soviet gulags. Wow. And he wrote the book, uh, uh, The, the uh, Gulag Archipelago. And also a life in the a day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, also about the same thing. And mm. he was he was finally expelled from the Soviet Union in 1973. Um, and uh, he when he left, he uh, he wrote a piece, uh, an essay. It was simply titled "Live Not by Lies." Mm. Now there's a current book by that title, trading off of Solzhenitsyn's um, uh, piece, mm -hmm. and it's really worth reading. Rod Dreher wrote it, Live Not By Lies. It's not very long and it's not very difficult, mm -hmm. but it's a stunner to see what's going on in this country right now in terms of creeping totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. And basically what, what um, Solzhenitsyn said is you, you, you can, if you're a Christian, you cannot live according to a lie. And you may not change culture, but you can keep culture from changing you. Mm -hmm. He actually thinks with enough Christians saying no and not living by lies, it is going to change culture, but it's going to cost them. Mm. He spent 10 years in the gulags, mm. Siberia. And, uh, and, and it's going to cost Christians now. It already is costing Christians. But when do we say no? Mm. When do we say no to the world and say yes to God? We have never faced a time like this in our history, but we are facing it right now and in spades. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so fascinating, interesting. I feel like in my experience just watching people 
of, of you know, of my age, Gen Zers, who kind of grew up with some semblance of the church or walked away and just kind of seeing this crux in culture has just been fascinating. And I think I've watched a lot. I don't know. I think I I've, frankly have seen a lot of people who's, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of uh, gathering from how they responded, but I, but who's who kind of feel like at one point, like Christians have been that like, towing the line of like, you need to do this. And whether that's a lot of perception, whether that is some people who take the name of Jesus and act in a way that's not, you know, according to Jesus, there's, there's, you know, a whole mix of many things, but it's just been fascinating to me, I think, as someone who grew up in the church and, you know, was raised in it and, and holds to it and believes who Jesus is, but sees other people, you know, I see other people who kind of grew up in that way, but are like, no, no. And I think, and I do think that the culture in this direction is right and it's it's just it's fascinating to watch people i don't know and i think i've personally as someone who i think one of the reasons tactics when i was in high school was so beneficial is because i was very like well i know the answer so bam you know like which is like doesn't help anyone um as someone who who gravitates to that that side to see so do i by the way just so you know that's uh-huh. my instincts too yeah yeah it's bam like, bam bam yeah i gotta hold Here. pull it back yeah like i say let me let me re- reload yeah. I, got a, <laughs> I got another mag here for you i'll yeah. give you another six <laughs> exactly yeah so i'm like okay i gotta do better about that but i think as i've watched people who respond to the culture i think something i'd be curious to hear your thoughts on is is the idea of like tertiary secondary primary significance that i think for me I had to delineate and it's a super nuanced conversation of like, you know, the um, issues that people disagree on where it's like, okay, I know that this is a lie, but how, and maybe this is maybe just befriending the world, but I don't know. I think how do we, how can I connect with someone who's, who's bought into this and, and not, I think, I guess, uh, here's maybe what I'm trying to say. I think one of the reasons that, like, it's difficult for maybe someone of the other of who disagrees with the faith is that, like, that creates a front wall to, like, who Jesus is. Yeah. Which I don't think, I don't know, how do we do that? Like, how do we not create this external border of you need to have these opinions. Okay, so let me, Jesus. Let, I, I get you here, and there's, there's kind of a lot going on. Yeah. <clears throat> Early Christians... Um, would not fight uh, in Caesar's army, okay? Mm-hmm. That some people mistakenly thought that was because they're pacifists. That isn't why. It's because uh, in order to fight in the army, you had to swear fealty to Caesar as a god, mm. um, which they couldn't do. Now, was that a barrier to the gospel? Mm. Well, sure. Now they can't go in the army, and they're going into prison. And they're going to the lions or wherever they're going, mm-hmm. you know. But they—that's a barrier to the gospel. Yes, but the, nevertheless, mm. they were not going to compromise on a really important issue just so they might have more acts. People would think more better of the gospel. Yeah. At least this was their thinking. Okay. Yeah. And this presumes too that if you comply with things that people are going to speak think better of the gospel Mm. okay when in fact historically it has been christians standing tall in the midst of persecution and nobly that has had a salutary Mm. effect on others in the culture yeah okay so cut just a couple of you know factual things here's just my opinion but i know the public perception, but I do not think in hardly any area Christians have actually forced their views on other people for hundreds of years, you know. Mm -hmm. You had state governments and, I mean, state churches early on, but after the the Revolutionary War and the the Bill of Rights, all that ended, you know, Mm -hmm. or at least nationally they didn't have that. Then states still had some churches, and then eventually the Bill of Rights extended all to the states, and so so that was gone, okay? So if somebody says, you guys have been forcing your views on us for ages, Mm -hmm. really, where? Mm -hmm. I'm curious. Maybe we have. I'm curious where. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been down on gays forever. 
well, wait a minute, being down on gays, i.e. thinking homosexuality is a sin or however you want to character, or even being belligerent towards them, which I don't promote, obviously, I think mm -hmm. it's wrong. But that's, how is that forcing someone's view? Do mm -hmm. we... You know, or or any of these issues, broader issues, there have been indiv there have been some cases, but I think very few, mm -hmm. and um, where where there's been improprieties even in the law. But this has not been characteristically the case. What has been characteristically the case is that Christians think they're right on their moral views, mm -hmm. and the culture doesn't like that, and they call that forcing your view on me. Mm -hmm. We made this distinction earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's not the culture thinking they're right. Of course, they've always thought they were right, the non-Christians. Now they are, in fact, enforcing their views, mm. that is, requiring us to act and speak in a very particular way mm. and not to say certain things mm -hmm. so that, um, so that uh, we, we, so that w that we at least look like we're going along with them, even in our hearts. We don't believe it. We've never. We, the, the 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 balance is completely in the other direction now, mm -hmm. and it's almost never been. So that's a, so that's just as, as point of information. The forcing view things is very different now with the culture than it was with Christians in the past. Mm, okay. Yeah. It was ideology in the past where we held our ground mm -hmm. and we thought we were right and we thought others were wrong. Now it's behaviors that we have to affirm. And participate in some fashion, or else, you know, you know, we're we're persona non grata, we're canceled. However, you want to put it. Okay. Now, with that in mind, then the second thing is, if we are going to be faithful, there's going to be a whole lot of people who will never listen to a word mm -hmm. we say, and that's the price we pay for being faithful. Yeah. All right. The, and so, if our thing is to f make sure we can get them to listen to us, read the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Read the Gospels. Jesus speaks against the Pharisees. And and the, the lawyers there say, the Jewish lawyers say, well, you offend us too when you say that. And then he turns <laughs> to them and says, and another thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, Jesus wasn't afraid to say what was true in a very firm way mm -hmm. when the issues required it and the mm -hmm. circumstance required it. Yeah. In fact, I'm just like uh, Luke 20, I think. I read Luke 20 on the airplane yesterday coming in. And, uh, and, and right in that section, you've got Jesus going on, you know, the parable of the— he told a parable that, that the Pharisees understood was against them, and mm -hmm. they were really angry at him. You know, he said, but he wasn't going to mollify them. Mm -hmm. So um, we, have to, we have to make peace with the fact that if we're faithful to Christ, people won't like us. Not because we are being ill-mannered or ungracious mm -hmm. or hostile or nasty or any of that, just that we won't budge mm -hmm. on the truth and we will not act according to their purposes that affirms actively affirms a false view of reality mm -hmm. okay it's interesting in matthew 19 when jesus was asked a question about divorce here's how he started it have you not heard that from the beginning he who made them made them male and female Mm -hmm. The first thing he refers to is binary gender of human beings the way God constructed. He's talking about marriage, but what's the first thing he does? He goes right back to foundational issues, mm -hmm. okay? So um, they're not going to be happy with that. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't care about the binary gender, but it was when he put the restrictions on divorce because mm -hmm. whatever God joins together, you don't tear apart. Mm -hmm. They didn't like that. Yeah. They wanted divorce for any reason whatsoever, okay? But he wasn't trying to mollify them. Mm -hmm. He told them the truth. Yeah, and so that's the second piece. First of all, I think our our past pressures and abuses have been overstated. The second thing is not everybody's going to like us. Okay. Mm -hmm. The third thing is our obligation here. Then what do we do? We engage graciously, respectfully, thoughtfully mm -hmm. with the truth. So there's a content, the truth, and there's a manner, mm -hmm. and then we let the chips fly. Yeah. Lay, I should say, not fly, but lay. <laughs> we, wherever they, yeah. fly, wherever they go, they go. They, this is it. We, this is what we do yeah. because we're standing before an audience of one. Mm. 
My goal isn't to win the world. Mm -hmm. My goal isn't even to win that person. My goal when I'm engaging a person is to be faithful to God mm. in that conversation. Yeah. And then God can use it however way he wants. Yeah. But of course, faithfulness entails or includes the way that I engage. Mm. You know, and Josh, you know, we're similar in the way, you know, our native impulses are in this kind of thing. And I've been in a lot of nasty, inappropriate my part inappropriate discussions after 49 years of Christian, I've had my share of them, okay? Mm. And I still have to be careful. Mm -hmm. I'm better than I used to be, but I still have to have my guard up. Mm. But um, my goal isn't to make everybody like, like me. Mm -hmm. It isn't to make sure if I'm really nice and accept all these things, then that'll be room for the gospel. Listen, we're a light on the hill, you know? How are we gonna be a light if we're putting a lampshade on mm. by adopting and buying into a lot of this kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. That's good. Tough that, issues, but... Yeah, and it, it makes me think of Luke. I think it's Luke 6 where Jesus says, you know, woe to you if they speak highly of you because so they, uh -huh. you know, they spoke of... Your father spoke of the false prophets, I think is what he says, but... No, of the good... Yes, of the false prophets. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And if they persecute you, that's the way they did to the, the yeah. good prophets. That's Matthew 5. You yeah. Know? Rejoice. Mm -hmm. Be glad. For great is your reward. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's encouraging stuff. Well, is there, we're about to wrap up, but is there anything you want to wrap this up with, conclude anything you felt was left out in this discussion? Covered a lot. Yeah, we have covered a lot and it's kind of hard, you know, to imagine where to go. My, my, my big thing right now, Josh, is, is, um, is, is helping the body of Christ stay faithful to Christ in the midst of the kind of difficulty we've never faced before. And um, unfortunately for our younger Christians, th th when I say younger Christian, I mean people, younger people in the church. Mm -hmm. I'm not presuming anything about the substance of their, of their uh, spirituality. Mm -hmm. But uh, younger people in the church, they are, they are being discipled by the world 10 times the amount of time that their good Christian parents and youth leaders are discipling them. Mm. And it's very difficult to deal with that. Mm. Uh, and if we are not equipping them with, with helping them have deep spiritual roots and commitments to Christ and also giving them answers to the kinds of questions that the culture is asking right now, mm. and that's where apologetics comes in, that's where Stand to Reason comes in, mm. str.org, by the way, str.org. Stand to reason, and a whole bunch of other organizations. Mm -hmm. We're here with Hugh Ross, for example. You know that mm -hmm. he's got a, a reasons to believe. A fabulous organization, and there's so so many more mm -hmm. uh, that are they're all over the place doing great work that we as a fo as a as a church can avail ourselves of mm -hmm. to build the next generation. Stand to reason. We have six conferences around the country called Reality Student Apologetics Conferences. And, uh, and, and these are to build middle schoolers and young school and, and high schoolers to be prepared to face the onslaught when they leave the protective environments of their church. Mm -hmm. That's realityapologetics.com, for mm -hmm. example, if people want to go to that. But in, in a two, week and a half ago, we were, just, uh, we were just in Southern California, and we, we sold out Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. Mm -hmm. And we just sold out our church next week in Seattle. And we're seven weeks away from Minneapolis. We've already had more than 2,000 kids signed up. These kids want to know. Yeah. These kids want to know the reasons why Christianity is true. Mm -hmm. And so if, if our churches are not somehow integrating a defense for the faith into their training in the faith, then they are, they are leaving their young people really vulnerable to attacks by the world. Mm. This is like training up a bunch of soldiers and not giving them the weapons they need to fight the battle and marching them right out onto the skirmish line. Mm. It's, but this is what's happening, and so we shouldn't be surprised that there are not more casualties. Mm. The availability of training materials and books and videos and podcasts and everything to do the equipping. Pastors don't have to do it. It's hard. Pastors got their hands full. Mm. That's why we're here. And when I say we, I don't mean just stand to reason. I mean we, the cadre of people in, in our profession, mm -hmm. um, we're here to help the local church. Yeah. That's our job. Yeah, that's good. 
Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Greg. It's great to have you. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for tuning in. To hear more, go to digdeeperdc.com.